All right, well, we're in 1 Peter chapter 3 this evening. 1 Peter chapter 3. As you get turned over there, um, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction. No doubt everybody here has experienced a time of difficulty in life that you would probably rather not have gone through at the time. It's undeniable that some life experiences can be excruciatingly painful. Not very many of us, if, if any, I would imagine not, not anyone would say that they like or appreciate pain or that they like or appreciate agony or suffering or brutal work when we're right in the throes of it. Many of us would prefer to avoid those times, and when we're undergoing those times, many either try to get out of them or they pray that God would take them away. Now, those of you who are here that are in the throes of education right now, maybe uh, school or college, can probably empathize to some degree with this as well. I can remember certain subjects in school that involved arduous amounts of memorization and a tremendous amount of tedium in working through the curriculum, and I didn't enjoy it at the time. I didn't appreciate it, and I, and I, I really didn't fully understand when somebody would come and tell me, you will appreciate this down the road, right? That's, uh, that's probably the most hated saying for every student. I've said it many times to my children, and they always look at me like I'm from Mars, and yeah, oh, okay, yeah. Um, well, in any such cases, and probably a lot of others we could mention as well, if somebody is going to do more than merely claw their way through and endure and survive, they have to gain and keep a certain perspective. They have to view the long hours of difficulty in light of future objectives, future ambitions. And so perspective is crucially important at school. It's crucially important at work. It's crucially important in most arenas of life. It's also critical to our relationships, folks. Appreciating people, those that we love, our family, our fellow church members, and our community, it can be very hard at times, can't it? That's a reality. Sometimes we get tired of people's quirks. We get tired of their idiosyncrasies, their extremes and their antics, and we just want to be done with them at times. That's the fleshly response. And those are people that we love. We haven't even talked about enemies. So how do we stay motivated and press on when sinners surround us? Well, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 12 that we will read here momentarily, wraps up Peter's discussion on relationships by challenging us regarding our conduct toward others and by giving some much-needed perspective to motivate us for the task. So I hope your eyes are on the scriptures, 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to begin reading in verse 8. Would you please follow along? Peter said, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. That's where we'll end for this evening. Verse 8, the opening verse of the text we're looking at today, begins with the word, finally. That indicates to us, it's not the, the, the last finally of the book per se, he's not closing his writing here, but it indicates that this particular section that we're looking at this evening concludes the second unit of the book of Peter. Remember I told you it's broken up into three sections, and so this is the second main body of thought that he's been covering. It began back in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 11, and all the way from there up to um, where we're at this evening... It covers or concerns specifically relationships. We've looked at a number of different relationships and the appropriate way in which to respond despite any circumstances that may come. We've seen that conducting ourselves appropriately towards others is often hard, haven't we? 
And so Peter wrapped up this section of scripture with a, a summary challenge and with some needed perspective to his readers. The flow of thought is pretty simple here. Peter challenged his readers in verse 8 that, uh, regarding their conduct towards other believers. He's going to give a number of commands there. In verse 9, he challenged them about their conduct towards those who treat them poorly. And then in verses 10 through 12, he grounded those challenges in an Old Testament citation. Now, can I remind you for just a moment here that Peter was the one writing this? I don't want you to lose sight of that. I don't want you to lose sight of the character sketches that we've done of Peter's life. We haven't tried to drag him through the mud. We've just looked honestly at him. Young, impulsive, extreme, abrasive, rash Peter as I look at the scriptures here, was now old, stable, balanced, gracious Peter. He's undergone quite a metamorphosis in 30 years' time from the Gospels up until the time that he wrote the book of 1 Peter. Keep that in mind as we look through some of his exhortations that he gave to fellow members of the church and maybe even let your mind drift back just a little bit to some of the interactions he had had with other church members early on as a young man, as a young Christian. First of all, we're going to see, as we look at these points, um, verse 8, challenged Peter's audience to care for fellow believers. Would you look at verse 8 one more time? Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. I mentioned that verse 8 consists of commands. It actually consists of five succinct commands about how we are to conduct ourselves. And I want to remind you also that Peter was especially concerned about life within a church. Even though these commands are applicable to other relationships as well. So you can apply them in other contexts, but it's especially in the context of church relationships. So those of you that are members of a church should really listen, pay close attention because this is for you. These commands are written in verse 8 in the rhetorical structure of what is called a chiasmus. All right? it's, it's actually a very common literary device where the middle item out of the five Um, is central. It is the central thought. And then there are two or more clauses that surround it that are balanced against each other by reversing their structures between the first half and the second half in order to produce an artistic effect. All right. And so if you want to read more about that, you can, um, but not during this time. I'll just tell you that typically the first and the last concepts are mirrored. Um, The second and second to last concepts are mirrored and so on and so forth. All right, so you kind of have like a reversal of the order as you get past the halfway point as those things are compared. An example of that would be something like this, just in, uh, this is not biblical, all right? This is just um, a secular saying. Never let a fool kiss you or a kiss fool you, all right? And so it's kind of just a literary device to reverse the order of words and, and bring a contrast, kind of a mirroring contrast. And so Peter does that here in this statement. So first of all, I want you to see as we look at the importance of care for fellow believers, Peter challenged his readers to have unity of mind. This is so critically important within a church. The specific phrase is, be ye all of one mind. Now the New Testament talks a lot about unity because it is vital to the life of a church. It is crucial to the life of a church. If there's competition between believers or different agendas within a church, we aren't going to function well, and we certainly won't demonstrate the transformative power of God to this needy world around us. Very few things will cripple a church more than disunity. But the New Testament also talks about unity often because it was a very common problem in many of the churches of the first century. It's not really a whole lot different today, but it was especially an issue then as new churches were cropping up. Churches often struggled to have unity because they consisted of people from many different backgrounds. People that weren't used to being together. People that were very isolated or segregated from one another in the world. I'd say think think of our own church. We have people who were exposed to and responded to the gospel when they were very young. 
and, they're, and they received the gospel. And despite their age, they're quite mature as a result at a much younger age. We have others who've been saved for just a few months or even just a few weeks. Even among those who've been saved for some time now, there are widely different backgrounds in the homes that they were raised in, in the churches that they've been a part of throughout their lives. Um, that's, that really leads them to look at a lot of things and come together with different uh, worldviews or paradigms. And they have to figure out how to get along with each other and how to sync up together with the same purpose. As a result of all the different backgrounds, many come into this particular church. It's, it's the only one that we really want to talk about, um, at least in this context. But many come into this church with different levels of experience, with different levels of understanding about doctrine, with different uh, amounts of understanding about biblical ministry philosophy and, and other things of those who are saved amongst us here. There are diverse spiritual gifts that God has given for them to utilize in and through this church body. And then there are basic differences of interests, differences of family and cultural backgrounds, differences of personality. And of course, many think that their way is the best way, regardless of how much they actually know, regardless of how spiritually mature or immature they actually are, or how much actual experience or wisdom they have. Their way is the right way. Well, uh, Dear friends and fellow church members, God's church and God's mission for this church is much bigger and much more important than any one of us. It's bigger than our preferences. It's bigger than our pet issues. Now, in our human frailty, it's very easy to lose perspective on what really matters and to get fixated on ourselves, on our likes, on our dislikes. We must guard against this tendency very carefully. This isn't just a human game that we're playing here. There is something divine that God has established, and he's got a divine mission for us. It's an awful thing when selfishness and stubbornness gets in the way of God's work. I'd say the same thing for any relationship, whether it's a church relationship or a marital relationship or a parent-child relationship, or whatever it may be, when selfishness and stubbornness gets in the way, it's, it's disastrous and it's tragic. In this context, in the biblical context here, especially don't ever sacrifice the unity of your church. Our unity is found in the mutual faith that we share in the Lord Jesus Christ and in the doctrines of Scripture that we have mutually bound ourselves to by joining together in this church body. Don't sacrifice your unity within this church for anything, as long as that unity is grounded in the right thing. The command here, be ye all of one mind. There's no exceptions to that. It's not just certain people in a church body that this is directed at. All, all are in mind here, all right? Be all of one mind. Nobody in the membership of this church or the churches that Peter was writing to were exempt from this command, regardless of position, regardless of experience, regardless of any justifications that one might come up with. This is not an emotional type of response that we are all to be in unity or in one mind, but it is literally a choice of the mind. That's why it says to be of one mind. And so I would, uh, I would exhort you, first of all, as we consider the commands here towards caring for fellow believers within a church body to have unity of one mind and to keep proper perspective in that. Secondly, the next statement that's made is one having to do with compassion, all right? Um, where are we at here? Finally, verse 8, finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Peter used the Greek word sympathes when he spoke this word. And in English, it's compassion. We derive our English word sympathy from the Greek word. It means to share in the feelings of another whether joy or sorrow, whether it's positive or a negative emotion that the brother or the sister in the Lord in the church is experiencing. Romans chapter 12 and verse 15 commands God's people to rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Sympathos, sympathy, 
compassion. It's a great picture of the kind of sincere, tender support that ought to exist in a church, folks. It's totally different than anything that the world knows. We must love each other enough that we actually share each other's joy when someone receives a blessing. We must love each other to the point that we actually feel the weight of the burden when someone receives difficult news or is facing a great trial and then do everything that we can to step in and help support the burden. I would ask you this, members of True North Baptist Church, are you engaged in the lives of others like this? And I'm not, even just, I'm not even talking about extraneous ministry outside of the immediate church body, but within the church, are you engaged in the lives of others like this? I know that some are. I know that some aren't. You need to answer that question for yourself. This is a command of Scripture. Some are intensively engaged on this intimate of a level, while others hold themselves aloof for some reason. And so I'd ask you, do you really know and feel the burdens and the joys of your fellow church members? Do you have this level of intimacy with others in the church body? And what do you do with that knowledge? If you do understand their joys or their sorrows, do you, they're going through a difficult time, do you just find yourself thinking, well, it's a bummer to be him. <laughs> I hope that somebody has time or resources to help that guy out or that girl out. Or do you move to support others? Do you move to bear their burdens and care for them? The Bible talks about it frequently. You go and say, be warmed and filled, kind of a concept like James says. And you don't actually do that which is needful to the body. You're not accomplishing anything. It does not help the person. Um, uh, the, the real compassion is backed up by action. And so we must support them in their joys and sorrows. And so we have these first two commands here as we particularly think about the context of a local church and the way that it should function and thrive together. Unity of, one, uh, unity of mind, be all of one mind, and then have compassion one to another. And then thirdly, the next command that is right dead in the middle of that verse, verse 8, love as brethren. Love as brethren. Now, as I mentioned, Peter put this attribute right in the middle of the list in this literary construction because it is foundational to the other commands that surround it. Love, in this case, it comes from the Greek word uh, philadelphos. I'm not pronouncing that exactly right according to the Greek pronunciation, but it gives you the, the idea anyway. Um, philadelphos is absolutely essential if we're going to have unity, if we're going to have compassion, if we're going to be uh, if we're going to have pity, if we're going to have courtesy for one another. In fact, we can accurately say that all those other commands are real-time expressions of loving us brethren. It's not genuine love if you don't express those other things. This brotherly love is the affection and it is the camaraderie that God's people experience with God's people. It is a special affection that shared as, as a product of being born into God's family. If you don't have it, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> if you don't have it, you're not in God's family. First John makes that very plain to us. It's not something that God's people share with those who are not saved. There is not love as brethren. There is, there is to be love for them, but it's a different kind of love. It's not listed in this way in Scripture. This is an intimate bond that comes into existence in seedling form at salvation, and then it grows uh, genuinely and continually towards other church members as time marches along. It provides a connection of the heart that can't be manufactured. It can't be faked. So love as brethren, the central thought in our relationships within a church. And then he continued on the fourth command is this. I know we're marching through these pretty fast, but I want to be able to get through this whole section of scripture tonight. He says, be pitiful. All right, that's the command. It comes from the Greek word uh, eusplankos, and it means full of pity. All right, I mean, the, the word construct just literally means that. It's not talking about being full of pity for yourself. It's not talking about trying to get others to pity you, folks. There are, uh, there are a lot of people that try to operate that way. It's not what God's Word commands. This term is a synonym for tender-hearted. The Greek word literally referred to the internal organs 
the liver, the lungs, the heart, the bowels, right? Those are different things that are spoken of in Scripture in the same context. And it may seem kind of strange to us to associate your liver, uh, especially your bowels, with this. Um, but in the Greek thought, the internal organs were considered to be the seat of the emotions, the seat of the soul. It's where, uh, where genuine uh, tenderheartedness flowed from. And so Peter used the phrase here to challenge his readers to care for their brothers and sisters in Christ sincerely, way down deep at the very center of who they were. Once again, not something that's manufactured or made up. This is genuine. It's real. It comes from a transformed heart that knows the Lord. It speaks of sincerity and it speaks of depth to the compassion that they have for one another. Our love and our service must be more than surface level or a heartless duty towards one another. It must be motivated by more than a selfish concern to look good or to feel good about ourselves. We must cultivate genuine love and concern for each other, which results in compassionate care and the bearing of burdens. And so be full of pity, um, have, uh, have a tender-hearted spirit about you towards others. And then the last command, the fifth one in that verse, is be courteous. This command comes from the Greek word philophron, um, and the etymology of the word literally means to be friendly of mind. Friendly of mind. Still use it very similarly in our own con uh, connotation today, but the connotation as used in Scripture is really a reference to humility before one another. It is friendliness, but it's really humility. This command is very parallel to the call for unity back at the beginning of the verse. It goes right over the heads of many people. But humility and humbleness of mind and thought is absolutely essential to unity in a church and in any other relationship. Now, if I'm on a basketball team, um, if everyone thinks that I'm the best player on the team and I need to shoot the ball every single time we move the ball down the court, there won't be much unity in the team. And they certainly won't be very effective in working together to get good shots as a team. <laughs> it also wouldn't be a very good team if I'm the best player on it. <laughs> so I wouldn't recommend being a part of that team. But for a team to be good, everyone must humbly accept his role and put the team first, not self first. It's the same in our church, folks. If people are always worried about recognition, about being assigned to the best roles or to particular roles or getting their way, we'll work against each other rather than with each other as a team as God intends. And folks, the work of a church is simply too significant for that kind of petty, childish rivalry to be going on. And I'd say this, that for application, if you're harboring this kind of arrogance or resentment, you need to confess it to God as sin, and you need to drive it out of your life once and for all. The New Testament has very harsh things to say about those who divide a church because of their arrogance and selfishness. Guard your heart against the kind of pride that would divide us or that would hurt our effectiveness as a body. Instead, let's work together, humbly fulfilling our roles to reach our city for Christ and to make disciples for God's glory. That's what we're here for. Now, through these five commands, God instructs his churches to be marked by love, to be marked by mutual support, and to be marked by unity. Peter knew that his readers had plenty of enemies on the outside, more than they could handle. Therefore, they couldn't afford to be enemies with each other on the inside. They needed each other to stand against the world and the flesh and the devil and to fulfill the mission that God had given them. The same is true today, friends. The other people in this assembly need you. They need the testimony of your faith. They need the spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit has given you. They need the love and the support that you can provide. Hey, let's always make sure that True North Baptist Church is marked by love of the brethren that demonstrates itself in these qualities that are depicted in verse 8. We simply can't afford the opposite. So God commanded his people to care for fellow believers. And then secondly, remember, he's wrapping up or summing this whole section on proper relationships. He's talked about relationships of, uh, of citizens to government, of 
of servants or slaves to their masters, of wives to their husbands, of husbands to their wives. And now he's just talking about church members, all right? So through these, uh, through these commands, uh, he is emphasizing the need for God's people to care for fellow believers. And then secondly, in verse 9, he commanded them to be kind to all people. He broadened it outside of just a church context. Verse 9 is particularly concerned with how we respond to evil people who oppose our church. <laughs> but it has a lot to say for how we should respond to any kind of evil treatment, not just against the collective church body, but that we may endure ourselves. And it begins with a negative command for us. I hope that you wrap your heart around this. It says in verse 9, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing. Do not, the negative command is do not respond in kind to evil. This command draws on the language of chapter 2, verses 22 and 23. Let me remind you what that says. Of the supreme example of the Lord Jesus Christ, it said, Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. So we have that same mirrored for us at the very end of this section on relationships now. We must not respond to evil intent, words, or actions by sinking to the level of those that treat us wrongly, whether as a church body or as individual Christians. The scriptures consistently teach that the sins of others never excuse our own sin. That's certainly the example that Jesus Christ set on the cross, wasn't it? <laughs> Jesus endured all kinds of false accusations. He was brutally beaten and he was murdered. But he never responded in kind. He actually prayed this instead, hanging from the cross with some of his dying breaths. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Peter called on those in God's churches to do the same not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing. They are, on the other hand, to respond to evil with grace. They are to respond to evil with grace. There's the, uh, there's the opposite side. Rather than returning evil for evil or railing for railing, Peter's command was this, but contrarywise, return a blessing. This command recalls the words of Jesus Christ that Peter evidently remembered very well. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44, Peter was present when Jesus commanded this, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now, we don't talk often in our day about blessing other people, do we? It's not typically a part of our daily routine. It was commonplace in the biblical world. And to bless another person simply meant to, to wish or pray for grace upon that individual. For us, it would mean praying that God would bless him or her, and even saying it sincerely and directly to their faces. The implication of such an act is that we forgive this evil person and we sincerely desire their good. When we endure real evil, that's pretty hard to do. Maybe you've had somebody slander you and it brought real harm to you, to your reputation, to your life. Maybe you lost a job over it. Maybe you lost a friend over it. Maybe you've had someone emotionally or physically hurt you. Worse yet, maybe they've done evil towards your children or to your spouse. Now, you may not be so bold as to pray for this directly, but maybe you've hoped that this evil person gets their just reward. That's the typical human response. Maybe you've wanted them to suffer, and if they did suffer, it gave you a sense of joy that they suffered. When you feel that kind of anger and bitterness and resentment towards a person, you cannot pray a sincere prayer of blessing upon that person. And yet, that's exactly what Peter called his readers to do. Now, they were suffering a lot more intensively than we'll probably ever know at the hands of wicked people. The New Testament ethic doesn't leave any room for us to hate another person. Now, we certainly ought to hate sin. 
We can't deny that. We ought to desire justice for innocent ones who are hurt. We ought to support the legal system in bringing about justice because it is the legal system's job to do so. That is their God-ordained job. But as individual Christians, the New Testament calls us to care for all people and to treat them with grace, seeking God's blessing, his supreme blessing of salvation for their lives. That should be the, uh, the ultimate and ulterior motivation in all of our interactions with people who were all wicked, just like we were at one time. But again, that can be difficult to do. When we endure the evils that I mentioned a moment ago, we want to hold them over people's heads and bring our own justice at times. But rather than taking matters into our own hands, God challenges us differently at the end of verse 9. He challenges us to trust in the Lord's reward. All right. The last phrase in verse 9 is, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. There are a couple of different ways to take the phrase, knowing that ye are thereunto called. That can refer backwards to the conduct that God has called his people to, or it can refer forward to the blessing that God's people will inherit. I believe that the parallels between this statement and chapter 2 and verse 21 indicate that Peter was referring backwards to the conduct that God had called them to do. It was the things that he had just stated in this very passage of Scripture. Peter was pushing us towards these godly responses by noting that God has called his people to this kind of conduct. And so godly responses are not optional. They're not optional, even if we are suffering at the hands of wicked people. There's no room in godly behavior, in sanctified behavior, for vengeance or for bitterness. We must not harbor hurts towards anyone, especially not towards a brother or sister in Christ. If you're harboring bitterness, if you're harboring anger, you need to drive it out because it's contrary to God's call for his people, as it's stated here. But thankfully, God hasn't merely called his people to just grin and bear it. Just put on a brave face and endure it. God promised this, that when we bless our enemies, God will give us a blessing. And so what blessing did Peter have in mind here? Was he thinking about a blessing in this life, this temporal life, or was he thinking about a blessing or a reward someday in eternity? Well, the quote from Psalm 34 that follows very clearly looks forward to God's blessing in this life. There are specific blessings of God that are placed upon the life of a person as they march through this life, as they march down, um, down the time that God has given them for this life. Some would say that um, Peter was talking about a present blessing from God. Others would say that the word inherit that's spoken of in that verse, uh, that, where are we at here, verse Nine, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. They would say that inherit and indicates some eternal blessing in heaven. Now, I have no doubt at all that Peter had both of those in mind. The quote from Psalm 34 makes that very plain. And then the, the statement about an inheritance, which is a future thing, makes that plain as well. Now, I, I do want to emphasize this. As we talk about an inheritance and the blessings that God promises to place upon his people in this life, we have to be careful because there are many of those who take that and, and try to um, bend that into a prosperity gospel type of concept or a health and wealth kind of a gospel concept where, well, if you do this, then God's going to pour out all this financial blessing and ease upon your life and everything's going to be wonderful and dandy. <laughs> now, God never promises wealth or ease for his people. But he does offer many graces in the present when they obey him. God hears and he answers our prayers. And since his word is wisdom, life will generally go better when we follow God's word. Now in contrast, if we take justice into our own hands, if we take vengeance into our own hands, if we allow our, uh, our hearts to be filled with frustration with anger, with contrariness, with bitterness, but not joy, um, those wrong emotions can and will easily dominate and destroy us. So ultimately, we must trust God enough to treat all people according to his will, according to his commands. 
Will you trust God enough to do what he says, even when it's unnatural, even when it's difficult for you? It is unnatural. It goes against the grain of our flesh. That's why it can only flow out of a transformed heart, a heart that's been made new, a new creature um, by the Holy Spirit. Will you resist the urge to react in anger when you're mistreated? Will you bite your tongue when you're slandered? Will you believe in the wisdom of God's word and the superiority of God's blessing? The challenges of verses 8 and 9 can be quite demanding. They're very unnatural, as I mentioned a moment ago. And so in verses 10 through 12, Peter demonstrated um, that this behavior and that this promise are the consistent teaching of Scripture throughout time by quoting from Psalm 34, verses 12 through 16. I want to summarize the quotation. I'm not going to read that entire passage for you, but you will see the components of it in what Peter had to say here. So I want to summarize that quotation from Psalms as a challenge to obey God's will by faith. First, we'll consider the pattern of godly conduct. This is found in verses 10 and 11, which are set up as a conditional statement. And if I really have to boil everything down to what are we driving at in this study this evening in our relationships with others, whether it would be within a church body or relationships to those who would do us evil from outside of a church body. <laughs> it's found really right at the beginning of, of chapter 10. The psalmist calls on all who want to, look at these words, love life and see good days. Calls upon them. Now this is... This is not a promise of prosperity, financial prosperity. It's not a promise of an easy life. Because many of the godliest people in Scripture never enjoyed those gifts. Many of Peter's audience never enjoyed such things. But we all know that at the end of the day, prosperity and ease really aren't the key to joy, are they? Hmm. You don't have to look hard to see that there are many wealthy people who are miserable people. Many people who face great hardship on the other end of the spectrum who are filled with joy. Rather, these phrases, he that would love life and see good days, they speak of a life that's full of significance, full of purpose because it's God-centered. And because God is the reference point, there's joy. And so how can we have this kind of joy regardless of the ups and downs of life? regardless of the assaults that may come, regardless of the difficulties that may come? Well, the scripture gives several answers to that question, but verses 10 through 11 offer a few simple keys for us. First of all, he said this. We're talking about the pattern of godly conduct here. First of all, if you're going to love life and see good days, he said to refrain from evil and deceitful speech. We're still talking about commands to God's people, God's people within churches here. This requirement <clears throat> ties the quotation very closely to what Peter had already said. And so often people may find themselves thinking um, that getting that evil thought off of their chest or telling that small lie is going to help matters in some way. And they dig themselves a tremendous hole by doing that. It doesn't work out that way. Evil words compound the problem and create more problems. And lies are found out, and they create much deeper problems. Think about guys like David that are recorded in the scriptures for us. It just continues to get worse and worse. And so the psalmist said that those who want God's blessing must refrain from wicked speech, from those types of speech. And next he said to replace evil conduct with good conduct. It's a general call to put off all disobedience to God's word, to Eschew, that word means, is an old English word, it means to despise that former evil conduct and to replace it with godly, obedient conduct. And finally, he said to seek peace and ensue it. This phrase describes somebody who is an aggressive peacemaker. This individual isn't content to just let discord and hurt feelings simmer under the surface. If there's a conflict, he doesn't just cross his arms in apathy and think, well, I may listen if that person ever owns up to his fault, but I'm certainly not budging myself. <laughs> no, 
Instead, the moment that this person recognizes that a relationship is broken or in danger of being broken, um, he pursues making peace. He goes after it. To go back to what we saw in verse 8, this is crucial to the life of a church. Jesus gave specific rules at length for this. It's not, it is simply not okay for church members, regardless of their age or their station in life, regardless of if they're just a cranky old man or whatever they want to call themselves, to harbor any bitterness, any frustrations, any broken relationships with each other without doing everything possible to resolve them. It's not okay. Do you have any damaged relationships with people in our church? If you do, have you done absolutely everything in your power to pursue peace? When somebody sins against you or you have a disagreement, do you talk behind his or her back to others? Or do you pursue peace aggressively? I realize that it's a lot easier to talk about someone than to talk to them. I know it's easier to hide behind a keyboard than to look somebody dead in the eye and say, I sinned or, hey, you really hurt me in this way. But God's will and the health of God's church are worth doing hard things for. Pursue peace. The psalmist said this. This is a promise from God's word. It's in the Old Testament. It's repeated for us in the New Testament to show that this is the consistent mind of God. The psalmist said, if you want to love life and see good days, that is, if you want a life full of significance and joy in serving God, you must watch your speech carefully. You must pursue godly conduct and write off any evil conduct. And you must pursue peace. Now, if you'll do those things, then verse 12 shows that he holds out a great hope to you. The psalmist noted, as we look at the hope of godly conduct, that God watches over the righteous. Now, of course, this is intended to be a source of tremendous comfort. It was a source of comfort to Peter's audience. Would you look at it with me? For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Sometimes we may feel like nobody notices how hard we're trying to do the right thing. Maybe we feel misunderstood in our efforts to do right. But even if nobody else in this world notices, let alone anybody in our church, God does. And it's not just that he sees. The implication of this scripture is that he cares and that he'll watch over his people. And not only only does he see, but it says his ears are open unto their prayers. Now, 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 hear me. Last Wednesday, we saw that God doesn't listen to the prayers even of a Christian husband who disobeys God's will. But here we find that God does hear the prayers of the obedient Christian. This promise ought to be very reassuring because sometimes doing the right thing feels pretty lonely. Some of Peter's audience were enduring very unjust treatment from unbelieving family members, unbelieving employers, unbelieving uh, masters uh, if they were slaves, and from unbelieving government officials. But even when the world feels lonely, if we're obeying God, we can be absolutely sure that God sees and that God hears. Now, we ought to also have the additional comfort and blessing, as we've talked about, of a church body that's standing beside us. But God is the primary source of this comfort. When you cry out to him for help, his eyes and his ears are open, and he'll sustain you and he'll give you what you need. Look to him for grace. Don't look to other sources for assistance, and for comfort and grace. Look to the Lord for grace. When the world rejects you for doing right, don't compromise in an effort to gain its fickle approval. Instead, run to God. God will be faithful as we obey. But then the text concludes with a very sobering reminder. But the face of the Lord is against him that doeth evil. In one sense, we might see this as encouraging, God stands opposed to those who would do evil to his people. He is for us, and he is against those who are wicked. 
But primarily, this is a warning regarding the consequences of straying from God's will, from God's stated path of obedience. Now, for those who are genuinely saved, God loves them too much to let them go down a path of sin without bringing consequences, severe consequences if need be. God will correct those who are his children, and that warning should, should remind us constantly and sometimes fearfully to stay on course. But this warning is far more severe for those who have never been saved. God's face here, the, the, it states that God's face is against them that do evil. His face represents his watchful care. Or should I say his careful watch? Even when an unbeliever doesn't realize it, God sees his or her wicked rebellion against him. That person stands under God's wrath, and until that person repents, he'll one day endure God's justice in hell. There may be somebody here today in this assembly this evening who needs to heed that warning. Your heart is evil and you've never repented of your sin and turned to God alone for salvation. You may look good to people around you, but your heart is full of secret sins. I want to urge you to recognize that God sees your heart, even if nobody else does, and you're on a path to destruction. There's nothing that you can do in yourself to avoid God's judgment. But Jesus Christ already took on himself the punishment for your sins. If you confess your sin to God and look to Christ alone for salvation, you can be forgiven. You can go from being under God's wrath to being under God's mercy. I want to urge you to call on him today for salvation. Now, for those who are saved, I'll say this in conclusion. This passage of scripture that we've looked at tonight provides some needed perspective as we seek to obey God's will in our relationships. Appreciate and cultivate godly relationships through hard work and through humility. Treasure the church that God has blessed you with. Appreciate your fellow believers and maintain proper responses to all people. Sometimes people hurt us. Sometimes people let us down. Sometimes people don't understand things. Sometimes they're immature. Sometimes they're rash. Sometimes they're apathetic. Regardless of what others do, God calls you to be faithful, to be a leader amongst his people, to follow his example, and then to set an example yourself. Regardless of anything, God will be faithful. And so, press on. Friend, if you would love life and see good days, obey God's will, clearly stated in this text. Well, we're going to close in prayer. We're going to take a moment to commit ourselves to obedience to this scripture. I hope that you'll do that as we close in prayer this evening. Let's thank God for what he's done for us.